Aloha, and welcome back to our conference, Advancing Women, Peace, and Security in the Indo-Pacific, hosted from Honolulu, Hawaii. My name is Tevi Bullock, and I'm a resident Women, Peace, and Security Fellow at the Pacific Forum. This significant joint effort between Pacific Forum and US Indo-Pacific Command brings together women, peace, and security experts from around the world to address seven key topics over the course of the conference. We will now begin session three, Building Bridges, Civil Society Organizations and Local Governance. Over the next 90 minutes, this session will explore the roles civil society organizations and local government actors play in advancing women, peace and security goals. This session also seeks to shed light on examples of innovation relating to WPS at local levels. We encourage you to visit our virtual conference booklet for a detailed agenda, which can be accessed via the link added in the chat box. This conference booklet also provides detailed biographic information on all panelists and moderators for the upcoming sessions. Please note that remarks made in today's program are on the record and a video audio recording of this session will be made available on the Pacific Forum website and Pacific Forums and Indopaycom's YouTube channels in the future. Today's conference is a public webinar, which means there are individuals joining the event virtually who are not visible to the conference panelists and participants. Participants are welcome to keep their camera on or off during conference proceedings. We would like to remind our speakers to keep their presentations to around 10 minutes uh, so we can have ample time for questions and discussions. For the Q&A, participants are encouraged to submit questions via the chat or Q&A box and can do so at any time during the talks. I'll now hand the mic over to your moderator for this event, Dr. Kathleen Keenas, Director of Gender Policy and Strategy at the US Institute of Peace. Thank you so much. And Dr. Keenas, over to you. Thank you, Tabby. And uh, really on behalf of the Institute of Peace, I'm honored and delighted to be the moderator for the Building Bridges, CSOs and Local Governance. This theme uh, deeply resonates with me as over the last decade, USIP's gender and policy strategy team has served as the secretariat for the US Civil Society Working Group on Women, Peace and Security. It is a nonpartisan network of over 50 civil society organizations with expertise on the impacts of conflict on women and their participation in peace building processes. It was established in 2010 and it has engaged uh, with uh, different parts of the US government around uh, the US Women, Peace and Security Act of 2017. And of course the advancement of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, UNSCR 1325. At USIP, we convene unlikely groups every day to practice really our message of peace building and to build bridges through listening to one another. And one of my favorite examples of building bridges happened around six years ago when we had the opportunity to improve familiarity between WPS NGOs and the Department of Defense. So we invited them all over to the uh, Institute. We had about a 90 minute session, great exchange. It concluded and afterwards the DOD folks came up to me and said, you know, Kathleen, those civil society members, their suggestions were very intelligent. And a few minutes later, the civil society members pulled me aside to say, you know, they were surprised at just how open and nice the DOD folks were. And you know what? I looked around and thought, this is what peace building really looks like, whether you're in Washington or anywhere or here in this fabulous opportunity with the Pacific Forum to build bridges, to listen to one another, and to help understand how we analyze the problem of conflict and how we integrate gender and certainly the women, peace, and security agenda into it. So I'm really looking forward to our speakers today 
and it is my privilege to introduce them to you now. Uh, we are going to have a little bit more time, I should mention, because uh, several of our speakers were not able to attend. So that means we'll have more Q&A, and that is fantastic. Because we have uh, Mavic Cabrera Baleza. She is the founder and CEO of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. She has, I mean, if you've been in WPS for a while, you know Mavic. And if you haven't, this is your opportunity to get to know her. Uh, she has done it all. She's one of two civil society initiators of the Women, Peace and Humanitarian Fund. And she has also been a board member of the Gen Generation Equality Compact on Women, Peace and Security. Her list of accomplishments are, are great. And one of the things that I want to highlight as you can you know, read about her more in your bio uh, program book, but she established the Young Women Leaders for Peace. And this is a critical conversation we've been having already today is the need not only to look to the future, but we need to make sure we're bringing these young women leaders uh, and integrating them into our efforts. Um, so welcome Mavic, and I will introduce also Christine Ong, uh, who's our other panelist today. Again, uh, people who've been in WPS for a while know Christine. She is the executive director of Women Cross DMC. She has really uh, mobilized a group to end uh, uh, the Korean War and to ensure women's leadership in peace building. She is well known in the halls of uh, Congress to uh, journalistic efforts uh, with the New York Times and the Washington Post. And uh, she is the recipient of the 2020 US Peace Prize for her bold activism to end the Korean War. So with that, I'm going to ask each of our speakers, uh, take a little longer than the 10 minute allocation and tell us about uh, your work and really help us build the bridge of how you have gone about linking local governments, national governments with civil society. So welcome and over to you, Mavic. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And um, one of the gifts of uh, participating in workshops or conferences like this is seeing old friends. And yeah, I'm so happy to see Kathleen and Christine here and uh, meeting new ones. So yeah, thanks to the Pacific Forum and the US Indo-Pacific Command Office of Women, Peace and Security for organizing this important conversation. I want to share brief information about our organization, the Global Network of Women, Peace Builders to provide a context for my intervention today. We are an international coalition of women's rights organizations and gender equality allies from over 50 countries mostly affected by violent conflicts and humanitarian crisis. We have members and partners in Afghanistan, Armenia, Bangladesh, Colombia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Indonesia, Iraq, Lebanon, Myanmar, the Philippines, Serbia, South Sudan, Ukraine, and Uganda. The list is not complete yet. And these are just few of the countries we work in. And I'm mentioning them to illustrate the diverse conflict and crisis situations wherein courageous women live and face risks every single day for resolving conflict and building peace. At the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, we work with civil society, governments, the United Nations and regional organizations such as the African Union or 
the Association for Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN and others in developing and implementing action plans on the Security Council Resolution 1325 and the supporting Women, Peace and Security Resolutions. And more recently, we have uh, been promoting the synergy between the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the Youth, Peace and Security Agenda. Kathleen mentioned uh, my work uh, with the Young Women Leaders for Peace and I will circle back to that later, but it's uh, in, inspired by the policy framework on youth peace and security. At the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, our flagship program is the localization of Resolution 1325, which is a bottom-up approach in implementation wherein we convene governors, mayors, councillors, community leaders, paramount chiefs, indigenous and traditional leaders, faith leaders, teachers, the security sector, and practically all key local actors. And central to all of them, of course, are women and youth peace builders. In uh, this convening, I would like to present a few slides. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in, in this convening, we adopt what I re describe as a two-step process in discussing with these uh, key local actors the relevance of the Women, Peace and Security agenda in their context. Next slide, please. I think it's the fourth slide, uh, next to our fourth or fifth slide. Next one. Sorry, one, <laughs> Jan, another one. Um, <clears throat> okay, here. So it's a two-step process uh, wherein the first step is the analysis of the conflict at the local level by discussing the root causes and the specific impact of the conflict on women and girls. So in other words, this is gender analysis of the conflict conducted by local authorities and uh, civil society in local communities. And step two is a discussion on the relevance of the women peace and security resolutions to their context. What does it mean to their own reality? So the main question that we ask here is, at the end of the day, what does resolution 1325 and the supporting women peace and security resolutions mean to women in a fishing village in Northern Uganda or to indigenous women in Colombia? If you are not able to answer these questions with evidence of transformative change in the lives of these women who are directly affected by conflict, we are failing the promise of Resolution 1325. Now, I would like to uh, continue by describing um, the rest of the process uh, in a localization. So after the first part, which we very uh, generically referred to as localization workshops, uh, we proceed to the next phase, which is the creation of laws and policies through write shops or writing workshops, wherein the local authorities, particularly uh, local councils, which are the equivalent of uh, local parliaments, draft any or a combination of the following uh, policy documents. One is a local action plan, which is a translation of the national action plan on women, peace and security, if the country has one. A second is 
um, the uh, drafting of local laws and policies in the forms of ordinances and local resolutions. And third is the provision, drafting of provisions in existing local development plans. In countries that have decentralized uh, systems of governance, most local, uh, local administrative structures have what they call as local development plans or community development plans or municipal development plan, depending on the uh, administrative structure. These are actually the blueprint of everything that mayors, uh, councillors, and other local authorities do in their um, areas. It includes everything from agriculture, education, health and sanitation, public works, uh, and so on and so forth. But what we've realized in our work in localization is that most local development plans, even in communities or municipalities affected by violent conflicts, most of them are either gender blind or peace blind or both. In other words, they don't mainstream gender and they don't see the realities of the conflict as something that they should respond to in their local development plans. So that is one of our influence in working with local authorities to, um, to integrate a gender lens and at the same time incorporate an analysis of the conflict. Uh, the third phase of the localization strategy is um, meant to ensure implementation and sustainability, effective implementation and sustainability. How do we do this? We do this by training localization experts. Um, for example, if we are talking about um, South Sudan, where we have also implemented localization, we've only been able to conduct a localization workshop series in two states. But South Sudan has now about 25 states. And even if we have, it takes a lot, first it takes a lot of resources uh, to be able to cover all of the states. But even if we do have the resources and um, the capacity to uh, carry out localization in all of the states, we won't do that because that is the responsibility of the government. And what we want to do is to build the capacity of government in partnership with civil society so they can do it on their own. And that's the um, purpose of training localization experts in countries and in specific regions or administrative structures within countries. The second is to, uh, part of this third phase is to produce localization guidelines. The guidelines is like a manual, a step-by-step -step manual that serves as a reference for local authorities and civil society to carry out localization on their own, even when we at GNWP have uh, moved on to other countries to provide the same capacity building support. And the third uh, component of this third phase is monitoring, evaluation, and reporting on the progress of the implementation of the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda at the local level. So for us, um, localization is uh, strengthening local governance structures to make them more gender responsive and conflict sensitive. 
and that the women, peace and security resolutions and the regional and national action plans that have been adopted are translated into concrete and necessary actions on the ground. Now, uh, shifting to another uh, question that was uh, given to me by the organizers. What specific roles do civil society and local government actors play in advancing women, peace and secu security goals? The contributions of these two sectors, civil society and local governments in advancing the women, peace and security goals are immense. First, let's not forget that civil society advocated for and co-drafted the groundbreaking Resolution 1325. There will be no women, peace and security agenda if not for the leadership and dedication of women peace activists and other civil society actors. Of course, we acknowledge and we are grateful for the support of member states like Bangladesh, Canada and Namibia who led the adoption of Resolution 1325 in 2000 as non-permanent members of the UN Security Council. We are also grateful for the support of UNIFEM uh, during those years. The other contributions by civil society in advancing the women, peace and security goals are one, by collecting up-to-date information on the situation of women and girls in communities affected by conflict. Because many civil society and women's rights organizations work and live in conflict affected communities themselves, they have profound insights of the root causes of the conflicts and the necessary response. Another contribution is that they advocate for, they implement, and they monitor the local action plans, national action plans, and regional action plans. And they hold governments and multilateral institutions accountable to their obligations under the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda. I want to share a few country examples of civil society work in advancing the women, peace, and security agenda. In South Sudan, women's groups campaigned for the 35% quota for women's participation in government. And this was adopted as one of the important provisions in the peace agreement that was signed in 2018. Moreover, South Sudanese women have very importantly de-escalated tensions between South Sudan's two main tribal groups, the Dinkas and Nuer. And this has resulted in reduced conflict between their communities. In Colombia, as many of us know, Colombia is a very divided nation along ethnicity, ideologies, social and cultural identities, and other factors. However, prior to and during the peace negotiations between the Colombian government and the FARC, or the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, women's civil society played instrumental roles in building coalitions, in rallying public support, in repairing community relations, and in laying the groundwork for peace building efforts before and after the peace agreement with the FARC. Now they remain very active in advocating for the implementation of the peace agreement uh, particularly its gender provisions. It's worthy to mention that um, the Colombian peace agreement is one of the strongest in terms of uh, gender provisions. Uh, it highlights uh, the responsibility of the government to ensure justice for victims of sexual violence in conflict, 
it demands for um, re, uh, return of the land that was taken from uh, farmers, especially uh, rural women's rights over uh, land, their, their right to land ownership and um, the obligation of the government to support uh, rural women. Another example is from my own country, the Philippines. Women's groups ran grassroots campaign to gather inputs for the formal peace process between the government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. They also relayed updates to the public which helped to ease community mistrust of the process because there have been so many unsuccessful peace negotiations uh, prior to the one between the government and the more Islamic Liberation Front. So it took a lot of effort to, to build public trust. So after the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsamoro uh, was signed in 2014, between the more Islamic Liberation Front and the government, women and youth peace builders in the Philippines campaigned for its ratification to turn the peace agreement into a law and ensure implementation. Now, um, another question posed to me by the organizers has to do with the barriers uh, that are distinct to civil society and local governments. So one of the pers uh, persistent barriers for civil society is the failure to adequately fin finance the women, peace and security agenda. Data presented by the Secretary General in his 2020 report to the Security Council indicate that bilateral aid to women's organizations in fragile or conflict-affected countries has stagnated at 0.2% of total bilateral aid, which is um, average of 96 million uh, per year. It's really a drop in the bucket compared to the need. Another um, major obstacle to women's civil society's um, participation, uh, full participation or meaningful participation in peace negotiations and other peace processes is the lack of protection for women peace builders who face threats and reprisals from armed groups and even government security forces. We can only think of Afghan women peace builders and youth peace builders who are among those at heightened risk at this time after the Taliban took power. But we've seen it many times before Afghanistan. We saw the same trend during the coup in Myanmar early this year. There are countless examples. Women, women's rights activists and peace builders are persecuted by implementing the women peace and security resolutions. It must be a top priority for the international community to address this critical problem. I will stop here and I am excited to listen to Christine and participate in the discussions afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mavic, uh, for that. Um really overarching understanding of your work and, and the specifics of how you go about uh, engaging uh, the women with, including the local governors, mayors, traditional health uh, and faith leaders in this process, that it is very process rich and that these people own the process. Um, I look forward also to the Q&A uh, part of the program. And I will now turn the floor over to Christine. Uh, we look forward to your remarks here. Thank you so much, um, Kathleen and Mavic. It's always so great to learn from you. 
And I just want to start by saying that um, I really resonated with Kathleen's opening remarks about, um, you know, meeting with what you consider to be, quote unquote, the enemy or the other. I've been a peace activist my entire life. And so um, when Sharon, who is on the on this conference, um, invited me to come and speak to, which was then PACOM um, here in Hawaii on Oahu. I was so nervous. And I have to tell you that um, speaking with um, some of the officers, some of the military, uh, I just felt that they were the most pragmatic actually in many ways. And so I really um, wanna thank Pacific Forum for convening this session and, um, and the Women, Peace and Security team within the um, within PACOM to Indo-Pacificom command to um, continue to engage and, and learn from um, the peacemakers, the women peacemakers. So since we have a little extra time, I, um, I did prepare a 10 minute presentation, but since we do unfortunately um, are missing our other speakers, I thought it would be great to share a short trailer. It's a two minute trailer of a forthcoming documentary about um, our transnational feminist movement for peace and um, which Mavic has been a part of. <laughs> and so um, if that's okay, I'm gonna just quickly share it. It's um, it's called Crossings. The filmmaker is Diane borchet Lim. She's a Emmy award winning documentary filmmaker. And we hope to, um, we hope that it'll start hitting the film festival circuit uh, sometime in the winter and in the spring. Um, of course, everything is um, up in the air because of COVID. And so hopefully we will get out of this pandemic sometime soon. But without further ado, um, this is the forthcoming documentary called Crossing. So um, let's see, let me first get to the trailer. Okay. And I think this is it. Okay, here we go. As a daughter of South Korean immigrants, I grew up being told stories about her homeland. This is Korea, a nation divided at the end of World War II at the 38th parallel. These stories made us fear North Korea. And it was something that I never questioned until much later. More than 60 years after the ceasefire, North and South Korea and the US are still technically at war. I decided I needed to meet the people that were supposed to be my enemy. And that's when I started to understand the legacy of a war that never ended. Breaking now in North Korea, women from around the world are preparing to make a demonstration for peace. A prominent women's activist group is planning a symbolic and controversial walk across the demilitarized zone. Women are disproportionately impacted by war and violence. And it's time to have a seat at the table. Peace. A lot of people say it was naive, and you cannot do this. Several hundred people are here to counter protest against us. Anyone who calls on engagement with North Korea, they've been maligned. If there's not agreement between the two militaries, the government does not feel that our safety would be assured. What are we doing that is so threatening? People think that the only way North Korea can be dealt with is to eliminate it. There is an image that there aren't real people and that they must be destroyed. This artificial boundary has kept Korean people separated. Thank you for allowing me to show that really um, briefly. And now I'm going to start my presentation. Um, okay, and here we go. Hopefully everybody can see that just fine. And um, so 
I guess my job is to kind of breathe life a little bit to the women, peace and security agenda. Um, there's all these resolutions, there's now national action plans. And I would say that our movement is a movement that is trying to bring it to the streets, trying to bring it to the halls of Congress, trying to bring life to uh, an agenda that is so crucial at this moment of where we're at, especially as we are coming out of this pandemic. So um, in my presentation, I really wanna share the strategies that we are using as a movement of women, grassroots women, and obviously grass tops women, as you see Gloria Steinem and some of the Nobel Peace Laureates. Um, so um, I wanna start by saying that um, what we've been seeing a lot in the news is that uh, the oldest war has ended with Afghanistan, when in fact, that's not true. It's actually the Korean War. Um, the Korean War lasted for three years. It claimed more than 4 million lives and was halted in 1953 with a ceasefire when military commanders from the US representing the UN command, North Korea and China signed the armistice agreement although they recommended that leaders on all sides return within 90 days to negotiate a permanent peace settlement. Tragically, that never happened. And so the Korean Peninsula has been locked in a state of war ever since, fueling a dangerous arms race on the peninsula in the region and globally. While this session focuses on local governments, our transnational feminist movement is engaging with government officials at all levels from the city council to members of Congress in the US, to the South Korean parliament, to presidential administrations. Before I share some of the strategies that we use to engage policymakers, I wanna first explain why we advocate for a peace agreement at the beginning, not the end of the diplomatic process. We believe that a peace first approach is key to de-escalating the nuclear standoff and creating peace space for a negotiated resolution. Um, the framework has been denuclearization first, peace later, and that has failed. It has prolonged and exacerbated the security crisis. So we believe that a peace agreement is the essential first step towards resolving the dangerous and costly nuclear standoff. So why a peace agreement? Failing to officially end the Korean War has fueled a low trust, low communication environment in which renewed conflict, whether through intentional or accidental escalation, could break out at any time. If war broke out on the Korean Peninsula today, it is estimated that as many as 300,000 people in South Korea would die in the first few days of fighting. And that's only if conventional weapons were used. Up to 25 million people would perish if nuclear weapons were used by either side. So a peace agreement would take the threat of using force off the table. It would also include disarmament provisions, such as verifiably freezing North Korea's nuclear programs with corresponding measures. So consider that successive U administrations across partisan lines have for more than a quarter century failed to stop the development of North Korea's nuclear program. Today, North Korea is believed to possess up to 60 nuclear warheads and its long range missiles may have the capability to strike anywhere on the US mainland. There's no military option with North Korea. Peace is a crucial foundation on which the US can make progress on longstanding concerns such as denuclearization and improved human rights. And I, this um, slide here is of Thomas Quintana who is the UN Special Rapporteur on North Korea human rights. And you know he makes the link between the importance of peace to advance denuclearization. Another such um, advocate for a peace agreement and peace is Jimmy Carter, President Carter. He says, the only way to ensure true security for both American and Korean people is through a peace agreement. And so to understand why peace first approach is the most effective strategy for resolving the nuclear crisis, um, the, the campaign Korea Peace Now released the report Path to Peace. The report also calls for the inclusion of women's groups and civil society in the peace process. And that's because uh, 
research shows that when women are involved in peace processes, an agreement is more likely to be reached and to last. Um, between 1991 and 2017, women's groups were involved in 71% of informal peace processes. This is a study from Georgetown University, and women's participation helps to legitimize the formal peace process among the public. I think this is a really important point of the role of women's groups in civil society. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing. Joe Serencioni, who was a nuclear expert and the former president of the Plowshares Fund, said, through the dedicated effective work of women cross TMZ, the issue of a peace agreement between North Korea and the United States has moved from the back burner of policy debate to the front of mind. They have convincingly demonstrated that we cannot end North Korea's nuclear program without a comprehensive peace. So let's talk about strategy. How, what tactics are we using to legitimize the formal peace process among the public? Well, number one, we engage senior officials. We believe it's important to speak with all sides. During the Trump administration, we, get, we engaged Matthew Pottinger. You see him on the far left. He should be in the far right, actually. Um, but anyway, he was at the National Security Council um, and Stephen Began, who was the Deputy Secretary of State in the State Department. And um, since the Biden administration, we've engaged with the State Department on a host of issues, such as the US ROK military exercises and the US ban on Americans traveling to North Korea, which unfortunately, the Biden administration just announced today that it would be renewing. So we've engaged the Blue House, uh, that South Korean um, senior um, advisor on North Korea to President Moon is Moon Chung In. And we've engaged with uh, the North Korean um, National Peace Committee. So on the far right is a picture of, of me traveling to Cambodia because of the US travel ban to meet with the National Peace Committee. That was uh, in December of 2019. We work with members of Congress on legislation to end the Korean War. In the last Congress, we helped to mobilize 52 co-sponsors, including a Republican of House Resolution 152, calling for an end to the Korean War and a peace agreement. And because of this incredible grassroots organizing, um, in this new Congress, Brad Sherman, who is considered a national security Democrat, um, introduced a new resolution called 3446 Peace on the Korean Peninsula Act. It calls for a formal end to the Korean War and the establishment of liaison offices. We do this by mobilizing grassroots communities to take action. Um, our broad and diverse movement includes multi-generational Korean Americans, veterans, students, housewives, small business owners, all working together to raise, to call for an end to the Korean War. In July, during our National Advocacy Week, over 200 of, of our grassroots members from across 33 states met with 87 representatives to urge them to support this new House resolution calling for the end of the war and also for resolutions calling for reunion of, of divided families. Um, this is a screenshot of one of our virtual advocacy meetings with Senator Hirono's office. And um, actually I just wanna point out on the bottom right is a fellow, she was one of our feminist peace fellows, Carol Lee, who's at the East West Center. And she gave such a moving testimony to Senator Hirono's staff person that uh, soon thereafter, Senator Hirono decided to um, co-sponsor the Divided Families Act with the um, Senator from Alaska. And so it just shows that when we actually put our minds together, put our hearts together and we organize and we act together, we can actually move policy. So we amplify our messages to the media, to the public. We regularly publish op-eds. We speak at events like this. We speak on TV, on the radio. We seize every opportunity to get our message out there that we need a peace agreement to end the Korean War. And as we've shown with our Path to Peace report, we also produce a report on the impact of sanctions on North Korea, especially on the women. We raise awareness of the ongoing human costs of the unresolved war. I think that's why the women, peace and security agenda is so important. We have to center the voices of those that are most impacted. And oftentimes, as we know, it's women and children. We also bring women peace builders together 
to discuss our vision of the peace process. Um, in 2018, in the far uh, left, we have um, a photo from our delegation to Seoul. I picked this photo because there's Mavic right in the middle there, right behind me. Um, we traveled to Seoul, South Korea, because it was soon after that historic meeting of President Moon with Chairman Kim Jong-un at the at Panmunjom, where they shook hands. Um, and so we wanted to show international support for the Korea peace process. And then we had a second meeting um, at the bottom left is in Beijing, China. We brought women from um, North Korea, South Korea, China, Russia, Japan, US, Canada. And, uh, and that was a historic first. And then I like this photo on the right, which is um, we were able to bring six North Korean women um, out Many of them never had traveled. It was the first time for them to have a passport. And so we met in Indonesia where we were able to have um, heart to heart conversations with them. So um, let me just quick, quickly wrap up. Um, let's see. So one thing that we're doing is we're redefining what makes us secure. And uh, I think that you know, it's so important for us as women to be redefining what that means. And I think the pandemic has created an opportunity where it's clear that all the investments in weapons and in preparation for war just simply can't protect human life. And that what we need is a fundamental reorientation of what makes us secure. What makes us secure? Healthy food, jobs, a clean and sustainable environment, homes, um, that's why Women Cross Team Z, we started an initiative with two other um, feminist organizations, Madre and Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, because we really believe it's crucial to democratize US foreign policy, to end America's forever wars and invest in genuine security at home. We recognize that it is critical to end the Korean War, not just because of the threat of nuclear annihilation that would forever foremost impact the Korean people, but because the status quo of the unresolved war is violence. Violence against separated families, against innocent North Korean civilians living under sanctions, and against Korean people who have to live under national security laws in both North Korea and in South Korea. We must also recognize how the unresolved war impacts others in the region, from the Okinawan people who live with the environmental impacts of sprawling U.S. military bases, tomorrow indigenous people of Guam, who would be the first in the line of fire in the case of a North Korean retaliation against the US first strike. To everyone here in Hawaii, who in 2018 came face to face with the frightening possibility of a North Korean missile attack. The Korean War inaugurated the military industrial complex. In three years, US defense spending quadrupled and set forth the US as the world's military police. Ending the longest US war won't just be symbolic in reversing America's long march of militarization. It will tangibly improve people's lives throughout the peninsula, throughout the Asia Pacific region. And I believe can help neutralize the great power competition between the US and China. So peace is the only way forward. And with women leading the way, I believe we can end this war and provide a positive future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And you know, I am so reminded of the various times we've been together over the last decade and really feel like I've been a part of your journey and I'm touched by what you have to say here today. And I'm gonna actually open it up for Q and A and I'm gonna begin with the first question to both of you uh, that really kind of comes back to some of the thoughts that Dr. Valerie Hudson introduced today. And Christine, I feel like this peace first approach uh, also really uh, is part of her effort that I heard her saying. But when you look at where we're at right now as a country, as a world, uh, especially around this Afghan crisis, um, and that your last statement, you know, so much of what we're dealing with really can't be solved militarily. Um, 
I am very interested in some of the lessons learned you see moving forward as we are on the global stage as a country are trying to wrangle with these unbelievable new predicaments and certainly the focus of the impact of what is going on in Afghanistan on the women and girls of the country. So I'm going to begin with you, Christine, because you just presented on this and Mavic, you have a few more minutes. And then I want to remind our audience that you can put a question or comment into the chat room, or you can just simply uh, use the uh, very uh, hand up kind of uh, process. Uh, and uh, I'll be looking for your questions. But in the meantime, uh, Christine, uh, thoughts on lessons learned from your own work and what, you would like to tell uh, the world right now, and, and certainly this audience, about lessons learned uh, from Afghanistan on your work. Well, we're coming upon the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the war on terror and the axis of evil. So Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, all these countries that have been swept up in um, US militarized policy and war. And I think that um, what we have learned, especially in this pandemic, as you reiterated, Kathleen, is um, that all the problems cannot be solved militarily. And that actually this is a critical moment and juncture for us to redefine what makes us secure. And so I think that as we move forward and as the United States um, shifts from becoming the world's, you know, uh, world superpower to actually trying to create a more global cooperative society where we can peacefully coexist, where not one country is not dominating the entire world. I don't think Americans want that. I mean, I, I think we've seen plenty of surveys and polls that show that Americans want uh, more diplomacy. We want more investments in um, a, a diplomatic force. We want reduction in the military spending. We want a reallocation in things like healthcare, in schools, in um, things that actually make Americans secure. So I would say there are three principles that we really need to be pushing, especially as those of us that are part of this one peace and security agenda. One is reparations. You know, what kinds of reparations are needed for Afghanistan? And I think that, you know, we don't need to just necessarily pull the plug. I mean, I don't think going back with military and troops is the solution. It hasn't worked for 20 years. I think that's patently clear, but we can make investments in civil society. We can uh, support um, peace building. We can support development. So I think reparations is a very important conversation to have. The second is as we shape foreign policy, whose voices must be at the table. Um, and I think you know a feminist foreign policy would center those that are most impacted. It would include the voices that actually um, know uh, what's happening on the ground, that actually can tell the human story of the implications and consequences of US foreign policy. And the third is how do we democratize it? Because, and how do we break down the barrier that exists between domestic and foreign policy? Because as it's being increasingly clear, not just in terms of the Pentagon budget, and how that is like sucking all the money away from the things that actually make us secure. But I think that now, like right now, you know, especially um, with Trump calling the um, the COVID, like the Wuhan virus or the Kung flu, and just like the repercussions that that has had on Asian American communities, especially elderly, um, you know, because of the outrage and the anger and all this anti-China hawkish rhetoric, how is that impacting, um, you know, communities here? And I know that the Muslim and the Arab community, they have experienced it for the last 20 years. Um, and so I think that, you know, especially as the United States, you know, is having a massive demographic shift, as I believe now we are at a, uh, a society where we, you know, uh, have more than 50% uh, be non-white. Um, I think that this 
the United States has so much possibility to show the world how we can peacefully coexist um, across race, ethnicity, religion. I mean, you know, we have the best to show and share with the world. And so I think that hopefully can reflect in the way that we engage with the rest of the world. So that was a really long response, but those are some principles I think it's important to have on the table. Christine, it, it wasn't long. It was uh, very full and uh, vibrant. So thank you. Mavic, I'm gonna turn over uh, the floor over to you. I, I'm very interested in how you see this moment in time. Uh, on the global stage with the US leaving Afghanistan, what it means, of course, for women, but what is the lesson learned and how do you see it in regards to your work of, on localization of 1325? Afghanistan is a painful lesson, uh, not just for Afghan people, but for everyone in the world. And the principles of localization, which are inclusion, ownership, and participation, are the principles that were missing in Afghanistan, not just in the peace process, but in the whole governance structure in uh, in uh, the provision or non-provision of uh, social services that are actually elements of human security. Uh, for example, economic security, health security, environmental security. So include, yeah, let me go over the, those three principle, principles. Uh, inclusion or its opposite, opposite exclusion. Exclusion is a form of violence. While we, um, you know, we we criticize or or condemn the horrific acts of the Taliban, we also know that a good number of Taliban are young people from very poor communities, very poor families that have been recruited to join the Taliban because of their distrust of the government, because they never saw any hope for a better future with one corrupt administration um, you know, taking over the uh, governance of the country. So that is a major failure, the lack of true inclusion. The second one and the third one, which are related are ownership and participation. And while I will cite the Doha uh, peace talks, uh, particularly the intra-Afghan peace talks as an example, a key question that is being asked by uh, civil society, especially local civil societies, who owns this process? And how are our voices uh, being heard if in this process? We know we, not all of us can go to Doha or, or Moscow because there was also um, uh, a negotiation in Moscow, but we can still participate and there are many ways to facilitate you know, our participation. And there are examples. Uh, Colombia is a, is a good example in terms of um, uh, ownership and participation of uh, civil society, local communities, um, indigenous communities. They, they didn't have to go to Havana to meet with the principal negotiators, but um, a process was facilitated so that they can be consulted and send their representatives to, uh, to Havana to present the, their issues and concerns that must be addressed in the peace negotiation. That was absent in the intra-Afghan peace talks. And then participation. Uh, while I'm citing participation in the peace process as an example, 
I also want to um, broaden this as participation in decision making, in leadership, in governance broadly. We know for a fact that uh, a good number of uh, officials under the Ghani government are Afghans in the diaspora who were recruited after being away from uh, the country for 20 years, for 25 years, for 30 years. While they have, you know, some expertise and, and skills that they, you know, brought to the table and contributed to running the country, that created an, a, a great dissatisfaction among Afghans who have been there all their lives. As such, they they, they uh, felt unrecognized, undervalued, and uh, did not have a say in, in governance. Um, but rather, the Ghani uh, administration, you know, uh, brought all of those people in the diaspora and, and quoting one of our the young Afghan women peace builders that we work with, they they came and and they stole from the country, and then they went back to where they are citizens or or they where they have dual citizenship or have permanent uh, residency in. So it's easy for them to uh, come in and and get out when it was uh, convenient. So yeah, again inclusion participation. And, uh, and ownership that were absence in, in the running of the country, including the peace process. Malik, thank you for those good points and, uh, you know, and the illustrations that you offered there. I am seeing a hand up. Uh, Hannah Cole, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to our panelists and moderators for this awesome session and for being so flexible. I am one of the coordinators of this conference, so I love seeing you guys think on your feet. Um, my question is for Ms. An, actually. Um, broadly, I was wondering if you could speak to South Korea's inclusion of WPS initiatives and peace processes with North Korea. Um, I know that the appointment of Kang kyung -hwa was kind of a big step forward for South Korea in creating a more um, gender equal cabinet, but as she stepped down, she was replaced by a male um, counterpart. And so um, as I'm doing my own research, I'm really curious about, um, you know, actions versus words of South Korea and how your own um, role in the region has interacted with, um, I guess, particularly the Moon Jae-in cabinet as it stands, because they have been, um, at least on the surface level, very interested in some sort of reconciliatory policy with North Korea. So thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing your answer. Thank you, Hannah. Christine, over to you. Okay, thanks, Kathleen. Um, it's a great question. And I wish that we saw more from the Moon Jae-in administration. Um, you know, I guess while I believe that um, Foreign Minister Kong is a great feminist, I'm not sure her, um, policy making necessarily reflected it. And so we were in a situation where um, maybe having a woman at the table didn't necessarily um, was a great advocate for ensuring more women peacemakers inclusion. Um, I would say that one thing that the Moon administration did was appoint a minister of um, gender equality. She's actually under the foreign ministry and she actually came from the Korean Women's Association United, which is the largest umbrella organization in South Korea representing a broad and actually politically diverse space. Um, and so she comes from the movement. So that was a great, uh, that was a great, you know, a sign. And actually part of that was because of the South Korean, the Korean Women's Movement for Peace, which is part of the Korea Peace Now campaign. And that is a coalition of four South Korean women's peace organizations. It's the YWCA, which has like, I don't know, 200,000 members. It's the oldest, uh, the Women Making Peace, that alliance that I was talking about. Um, and uh, they had engaged with um, Jackie O'Neill, who many of you may know, is the first woman peace and security ambassador to Canada. And basically seeing what Canada did by appointing um, the first woman peace and security ambassador, they took that 
and took it to the Blue House and said, look, there is a ambassador in Canada that is doing this. And if you believe in this, that this is this is really important to do this. Now, my critique is that uh, while it's great that they appointed her, um, she's not necessarily um, being an ambassador in terms of inter-Korean. And I feel like um, we often like point the finger at South Korea and say, how come if your platform, Moon Jae-in, you want reunification, you want um, inter-Korean reconciliation and peace. That's where I think it gets a little tricky. And that's where I feel like it's really great to have the Pacific Forum, the Indo-Pacific Command, because um, sometimes the U.S. and the U.N. Command can play an, as, as an impediment, as an obstacle. So you look at the historic um, uh, meetings that took place between North and South Korea in 2018 in, in Panmunjom and in Pyongyang, the joint inter-Korean military agreement that was signed. I mean, they wanted to link the trains, for example, at the DMZ and the UN command came in, really the US forces in Korea and said, wait a minute. And this was the Trump administration. I'm going to, I'm going to give the Biden administration a clean slate, but they um, said, uh, no, that would actually be in violation of, of UN Security Council sanctions. So um, this is why, you know, as much as like, I would love to just like support the South Korean women's peace movement to try to engage with the North Koreans. But when there isn't progress on peace, and that includes between the US and North Korea, there is no progress between the North and the South Korean women. It is this weird jigsaw puzzle and it's like this Jenga puzzle, but that's why it has to be an international movement. And that's why it really has to include US women to um, support our government, now the Biden administration, to help bring closure to this war. It is a, a tricky situation. And I really would love all of your support because I do feel like the women that are especially in the military that are in these positions are pragmatic. They know that um, this has not been, you know, we look at like U.S. troops leaving Afghanistan, but we still have 30,000 U.S. troops in South Korea. We have the largest military base in the world. And uh, and it's now I don't think North Korea is saying that the U.S. bases has to leave. But I just think, you know, as Americans, we have to put, present the question, when do we end the occupation? When do we end um, our U U.S. military footprint on the Korean Peninsula? I'm looking to our chat room and also to the yellow hands or whatever color hands coming up. And I uh, certainly have one with uh, Monica Herrera. Good to see you, Monica. Hi, thanks so much. And uh, thanks to, to the panelists, uh, some really great perspectives. So I do work uh, in Indo-PACOM's Office of Women, Peace and Security. Um, and I've also been uh, a member of the, the armed forces since, since I was 17 years old. So I've been in the defense sector my whole life. Uh, and I am obviously very committed to WPS and I see a role for DOD uh, in advancing these principles and in, uh, but, but my question for you and one of the reasons why we really wanted to have this panel was um, because uh, Christine, you know, when you came to our course back in 2018, that was the first time I'd really had any interaction with a civil society organization. And similarly, I think you mentioned that, um, you know, you, you had some, you know, potential anxieties about it as well, but, you know, once you meet in person, it can really um, create really relationships and benefits. And so my, I, I, I want to start my question with, with Mavic um, as we are looking to localize our WPS efforts. Um, what would be your recommendations or best practices for the defense sector when we're seeking to engage with civil society organizations? Um, and then kind of a, a derivative of that question for you, Christine, um, would be kind of what do you see as DOD's role then in, in WPS? Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I respond now, uh, Kathleen? May I have the floor? Please, please take the floor, Mom. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that question. Um, I'm sure you know that engagement, um, especially actual uh, partnership with the security sector 
in the advancement of the women, peace and security agenda is still a contentious issue among uh, women's rights activists. Uh, one uh, school says, no, we're not going to engage, um, let alone uh, partner with the security sector because they are the instruments of the state to, um, you know, to militarize, uh, to use arms, to oppress people, to uh, promote the business of war. The other school um, says that might be true to some extent, that they are an instrument of the state to advance a militar militarized, militaristic agenda, but if we are not, if we're not going to talk to them, engage with them, hear where they are coming from, and for them to listen from our perspectives as women's rights activists, as women peace builders, that is not going to change. And that is where the global network of women peace builders um, is on this uh, side, you know, on, on this um, debate. Um, as I have mentioned in my presentation, uh, in our localization um, strategy, one of the um, uh, key actors are um, uh, security uh, sectors who operate at the local level. Uh, military personnel who are um, deployed in local communities, police forces who have the same assignments. So um, I, and, and interestingly, we, we, we've had so many conversations with them, the, the you know, armed forces um, and police forces at the local level. And when we talk to them, they would say, uh, please talk to uh, the Ministry of um, Defense, talk to our generals and convince them of how important the women, peace and security agenda. And that would, you know, uh, everyone would follow suit. So to us, we, we use what we criticize uh, in the security sector, which is its um, hierarchical uh, character in um, engaging more and in collaborating. And I'm happy to share that we have conducted um, training um, and work workshops with um, armed forces in the Philippines and Nepal. We've had discussions with armed forces and other security sector actors in, in Colombia. So my suggestion is let's, start the conversation and sustain the conversation that we all want peace and and our friends in in the military are, are telling us are telling me believe me mavic the last thing that we want most of us want to do is use that gun uh if you know if we can that would be the last resort of course not all of them are are thinking the same. But going back to uh, my recommendation, start the conversation, deepen the conversation, um, discuss the women, peace and security resolutions together, especially their, their applications at the local level, and, 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 and listen to the local population's aspirations for peace. And together with civil society and other actors, um, identify um, common, um, yeah, common strategies. Um, and, and the other point that I would also uh, like to, in fact, I might ask you a question back. Uh, one of the global goals presented by the Secretary General uh, in, uh, during the 20th um, anniversary of Resolution 1325 was to reduce military spending. And um, I would like to know how is that received 
by um, people in the defense department, people in the armed forces. Because for us, we actually qualify that by saying we at the Global Network of Women Peace Builders reduce weapon spending. That's what it, which is different from reduce military spending because we believe we need, we still need the expertise of the security sector especially, for example, on the issue of protection of women peace builders and activists. Using your expertise, how can we ensure security for us? Thank you. Malika, I, uh, I'm gonna turn it back to Monica. Uh, I think you have a question from Mavik here. Yeah, so I mean, first, first of all, I certainly can't speak for, you know, the, the entire uh, US government or, you know, some of the other agencies as we look to, I think, right size our investments when it comes to our foreign engagements. Um, but I would just agree with you, Mavic, when it comes to looking more closely at not just uh, is there funding going to the defense sector, but where within the sector is it going, right? Because you've mentioned, you know, we we have folks doing all sorts of work in our military. We have we have a huge military, um, including, you know, civil affairs, those folks who do uh, engage with the communities to better understand the security situation uh, so that we can better inform our own strategies. We obviously have a lot of uh, trained personnel uh, for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And that is one of those engagements of all the military engagements um, uh, that, that we could be doing. That one is pretty much guaranteed to happen in our region, in the Indo-Pacific, very highly prone to disasters. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're maintaining that capability uh, to assist if a, ho if a host nation um, requests that assistance from us. Um, and then obviously there's, you know, there's, there's our office and we, have seen growing investments uh, year on year since the passage of um, the WPS Act in 2017 uh, towards WPS in the Department of Defense. Uh, and so, you know, we, we obviously think of that as, as a good thing um, because it enables us to better connect with uh, organizations like, like you, uh, with more actors within the security sector um, to kind of build those bridges uh, and, and potentially redirect some of our efforts um, to building true peace and stability. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thanks. Well said, Monica. I am looking at the time. I understand that uh, in Hawaii, uh, it's near lunchtime. And here in Washington, I'm living through a, quite a storm here. So I'm going to suggest that we take about five more minutes. I'm going to make sure uh, Justin Goldman uh, uh, question in the um, chat room. Uh, Justin, are you online? Do you want to summarize your question? Uh, I believe it's to Mavic. Uh, sure, I can go ahead and do that. Thanks, Justin. Uh, sure. So um, one of the keys of uh, mainstreaming within the forces is, uh, you know, examples, people really latch on to case studies. And a little over a decade ago, there was, uh, at the time, a uh, brigade commander in the Philippine Marine Corps named uh, General, now then became a general, General Karma, and he had a lot of success in Sulu, obviously uh, an area that has experienced some uh, unforgiving conflict. And it sounded like he was able to forge that partnership we're all looking for with a key civil society actor who not only in applying uh, development, you know, support efforts, but also in the conflict resolution side. And, you know, are there potentially more, you know, obviously with the broad range of experience with GNWP, you know, I, I was going to see if uh, Ms. Cabrera Beleza has uh, maybe general trends, and I think she touched on it a bit uh, in her previous remarks, but potentially expanding on that. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Mavic, I'm going to ask mm -hmm. you to respond, and then if you would uh, give us a final wrap up of your key message that you want to make sure our audience here today uh, takes away with them. And Christine, I'm going to do the same, and then we will wrap up this particular panel. Uh, Malvik, though, to Justin's question. Uh, thank you, uh, Justin, and thank you, Kathleen. 
Uh, another uh, inspiring example of a partnership between uh, armed forces and civil society is from Nepal. Uh, following the um, peace agreement, I believe it was signing of the peace, comprehensive peace agreement, I believe it was in 2006, there were still a lot of guns and armaments around and uh, they did not, Nepal did not get uh, a lot of support from the international community in their peace process. And, and interestingly, they also, dim, they also decided, the Nepali people, the government and, and uh, the Maoists decided that they will negotiate among themselves, meaning there will be no international mediators and uh, facilitators. So uh, while that might have, uh, you know, uh, plus points on its own, uh, they also were not able to get support from the international community in terms of um, disarmament. And what happened was uh, some uh, leaders in the armed forces and one of the few outstanding, uh, very progressive thinking um, uh, leaders within the Nepali armed forces collaborated with civil society in, in implementing a disarmament program, like identifying where, you know, the communities where um, guns were still proliferating and, uh, and, and um, yeah, and, and working with that information to concentrate in those areas of the country where, where uh, yeah, proliferation, proliferation of armaments was, was still a major problem. And, and because of that, their own disarmament program achieved certain level of success. There's still uh, problems here and there, but they were able to do it on their own. So I think that was an excellent partnership between uh, the security sector and uh, the arm uh, and civil society. So uh, for my um, uh, final message, I want to emphasize that localization with uh, women's rights activists and youth activists uh, at the core, ensure approaches that are inclusive and participatory, which are necessary ingredients of, um, uh, necessary ingredients that would ensure success of national and international peace efforts. Thank you uh, to uh, the organizers and Kathleen for outstanding moderation. And uh, thank you also to Christine and of course to all of you for your enthusiastic participation. Thank you so mu much, Mavic. I'm going to turn it over to Christine before I say anything at the end here. Thank you so much um, for having me today. I'm sure that some of the things that I shared were way outside of um, the lane for many of you, but um, it's going to take talking, right? And understanding uh, historical context as Pam lays out. Um, and maybe I'll just end with like a little story. Um, which seems irrelevant today in light of the Biden administration's news that they are continuing the travel ban on Americans. So when we were in Pyongyang in 2015 um, at this Women's Peace Symposium and the North Korean women shared with them how the war impacted their lives, including still going on today in the form of sanctions, um, it was just so heavy, like one woman shared, she didn't have hands, so her arms were just dangling um, and she was seven and she had told the story how during the war, she says that uh, a US soldier shot at her hands as she was trying to escape um, from her home. And uh, it was just, you know, really a heartbreaking morning, just hearing those stories. And it was important for us to be there, to bear witness to um, what this war 70 years ago, you know, and how the trauma still lives on and on. But there was this moment where um, 
retired U.S. Army Colonel Ann Wright. Uh, she had served in the U.S. Army for 17 years, um, actually caught eyes with uh, a five-star general, a North Korean woman. And they came and approached each other. And even though they couldn't speak, because Ann doesn't know Korean and she obviously didn't know English, there was this moment um, of understanding. And Ann later reflected, uh, you know, obviously kind of tearing up, which is very uncharacteristic for her. Um, but she just said, you know, when she met her face to face and she just thought, my goodness, you know, I spent so many years like being afraid of the North Koreans coming across the DMZ. And then they were so afraid of the Americans coming and doing regime change or bombing. And, uh, and instead of preparing for war, they should have spent all those years in the military working for peace. And so I do believe like to Monica's question, what can DOD, what can the Women, Peace and Security Agenda do? I am really excited about engaging because I do believe we need allies across all sectors. And, you know, there are champions within the DOD. And I believe that many of you are on the call today. So I look forward to engaging with you. We need to build understanding and we only do that through sharing and through sitting together face to face, hopefully out of the pandemic soon, but um, at least virtually like this. So thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you to our two panelists, Mavic and Christine for not only very concrete summary of your work, but very much tied to the urgency that we're looking at in our world today, that uh, peace first is really about all of the crises that are confronting us, whether it is COVID or climate change, or the fact that these wars aren't ending and we need new strategies and that the women, peace and sec security agenda though might be 20 years old, it is still very alive and an excellent agenda for building that peace. So thank you for bringing your stories of witness and effort throughout uh, your days. And I am going to thank our our organizer, moderator, Tevi Bullock, and turn the floor over to you for wrapping up this session. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kinas, for moderating this excellent session. Thank you to our panelists, Mavic Cabrera Beleza and Christine Ahn, for your insightful, inspiring, and provocative remarks. Uh, and Ms. Monica Herrera from uh, US into Paycom for your contribution to the conversation. And thank you to our audience members for your thoughtful questions. Mm -hmm.